for joining us on our Made Local series to celebrate the publication of the 20th anniversary edition of Bone Wars, The Excavation and Celebrity of Andrew Carnegie's Dinosaur by Tom Ray, with a foreword by Matthew Lamana. Hello, I'm Stephanie Flom, Executive Director of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures. Welcome. Made Local is presented in partnership with the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. Thank you to the library, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, the University of Pittsburgh Press, and to our friends at Whitewell Bookstore, where you can purchase copies of Tom's book. Tom is going to speak about the book, then be joined in conversation with Matt Lamana, resident dinosaur expert and the principal researcher at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, which houses one of the world's largest dinosaur collections, including, of course, Andrew Carnegie's dinosaur. Introducing Tom Ray is the newly appointed director of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, Gretchen Baker. Gretchen previously served as the director for museum experiences at the Luca Museum of Narrative Art in Los Angeles, the vice president of exhibitions for the Natural History Museums of Los Angeles County, which includes the Natural History Museum and the La Brea Tar Pits. Gretchen began her career as a researcher at the Field Museum in Chicago and is passionate about connecting people to the stories of our planet, whether they be about dinosaurs, ancient civilization, or the living nature in city parks. I know she is looking forward to meeting you. Please welcome to Pittsburgh and to our made local stage, Gretchen Baker. Gretchen? When I joined the museum in April of this year, I was already familiar with Diplodocus carnegii, the long-necked, plant-eating dinosaur affectionately known as Dippy. I'd seen the model of Dippy on social media wearing scarves and modeling face masks. I'd seen cast of the fossil in Chicago and London. Of course, it was breathtaking to finally see it face to face, looking up at the real fossil in our dinosaur hall here at the Carnegie. But I still didn't know Dippy until I read Bone Wars by Tom Ray. When it was first published 20 years ago, Bone Wars thrilled readers with its vivid depictions of the early days of the dinosaur boom, larger than life personalities like Andrew Carnegie and William Holland, the first director of the Carnegie Museum, and of course, the hunt that culminated in the discovery of Diplodocus carnegii. Dippy is a specimen that brought dinosaurs to life for millions of visitors to museums all over the world. Tom's achievement is more than a fascinating page turner, recreating the cross-continental quest and its backroom dealings. It's also a diligent look at the quickly evolving science of the era as researchers and headline editors barely kept up with each other. The persona of Dippy has changed over the last 125 years. From mysterious monster to an icon of natural history museums around the world to mascot of the Carnegie. But it remains a symbol of what can happen when the rigor of research converges with our innate wonder of the natural world. It's fitting that my colleague Matt Lamana penned the foreword for this 20th anniversary edition. Matt is a vertebrate paleontologist and the museum's principal dinosaur researcher and carries on the tradition of searching Earth's rocks for the remains of dinosaurs. Matt is not alone at the Carnegie in his quest to understand the evolution of life on Earth. While Matt looks for dinosaurs in Antarctica, Jen Sheridan studies amphibians in Borneo, Chase Mendenhall tracks birds in Panama, and Mason Heberling inventories wildflowers of Western Pennsylvania. As a new Pittsburgher, I'm thrilled at this opportunity to join with Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures and the University of Pittsburgh Press for a fascinating conversation between Tom and Matt. I invite fans of the book to return to its pages and to glean new insights. I welcome first time readers who like me will now see dinosaurs and our own Dippy in a profound new light and with renewed appreciation. I hope you'll join me in congratulating Tom on this milestone and on a work that remains as relevant and readable as it was 20 years ago. Thank you for joining us and please enjoy this discussion of Tom Ray's Bone Wars.
Hi, I'm Tom Ray, and I'm the author of Bone Wars, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about that book, but first I'd like to thank the people at Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures for making this possible, and I'd like to thank the people at the University of Pittsburgh Press who've just recently published a 20th anniversary edition of my book. Um, the full title is Bone Wars, The Excavation and Celebrity of Andrew Carnegie's Dinosaur. It's about a dinosaur, a diplodocus, if you know what that is, a long-necked, long-tailed, <clears throat> elephant-legged sauropod dinosaur was discovered north of Medicine Bow, Wyoming, in 1899, and went on to be the world's first world-famous dinosaur. It's a wonderful story. It's a story about West and East. It's a story about how science got done and how fast that was changing at the time. And most of all, it's a story, and the King of England has a part. And it, most of all, it's a story of, um, of people, of enormously strong personalities. And it's a story of, um, and the wonderful thing about how people communicated at that time was they wrote letters to each other and other people saved their letters. And so through those letters, we get to feel these, these strong personalities in a way that we may never get to again the way we communicate now because everyone assumed their letters were completely private and um, they and so their emotions and their feelings show in these letters that were so carefully kept and recorded in order. So that whole combination of events made this book possible for a guy like me to come along a hundred years later and try to figure out what happened. Um, the story opens uh, in London in 1905 with the delivery of a cast of this dinosaur um, to, the, uh, to the Natural History Museum there in London. Um, all kinds of people were there. The press was there. Uh, lords and ladies were there. Uh, and Andrew Carnegie was there to deliver the dinosaur to the king. The king didn't manage to show up that day. Uh, but the press had a field day. There's a wonderful cartoon of Carnegie himself. You know, he was born in Scotland and was known on both sides of the Atlantic um, extremely well. And there's a little, there's a picture of a little, and he was very short. He was five feet, two inches tall. There's this cartoon that ran in the, uh, in the papers in London um, of a little short Andrew Carnegie in a kilt and a little Scottish bonnet. He's knocking on the door of the British Museum, and behind him he's pulling a pull toy dinosaur with a tail, long, long tail that looks like it stretches all the way back to Albany County, Wyoming. That's how it fits in my mind. So um, that's the kind of connection that is going on through throughout these stories. There are um, the the first strong personality, though. Then we circle back in the story to uh, Wyoming in the 1870s and 1880s, where we meet this guy, Bill Reed, who first came to the West as a buffalo hunter and ended up working for the Union Pacific Railroad. And he was finding bones, dinosaur bones, right near the, right near the railroad in the 1870s. He worked for uh, the great Yale paleontologist, O.C. Marsh, um, digging bones. And by the 1890s, he was working for the brand new University of Wyoming, which was only, which was less than 10 years old at the time, uh, finding fossils around, around the West. Reed was a self-taught guy, a not very educated guy who had a great talent for understanding anatomy and bones and how they fit together, certainly from his earlier time as a, as a hunter and, um, and later as a, as a paleontologist and bone finder. He was amazingly good at what he did and he had a wonderful instinct for knowing where to look. Um, one one correspondent called him that free-hearted frontier hunter. He was an enormous storyteller, and uh, it's funny because in the West, uh, his reputation has lasted as this sort of pioneer, wonderful guy. And in Pittsburgh, uh, his his reputation is sort of oh, Bill Reed. Yeah, you couldn't really trust what you you couldn't always trust what he said, you know. So that that kind of difference turns up in these letters that lasted a hundred years. Um, Another one of the great people is, uh, is William Holland. He really dominates the whole story. Uh, he was the director of the Carnegie Museum and chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh at the same time. He was a protege of Andrew Carnegie. Um, he, was, he was himself originally a Presbyterian minister um, and then later became a, a, a lepidopterist, a moth and butterfly guy of some renown and, and eventually um, sort of a self-taught, also vertebrate paleontologist once he came to work with the Carnegie Museums. Holland was not a very nice person to work for. Of all the people I got to know through their letters in his book, and there were many, um, 
He was the one I liked the least, I must confess. He kind of looked down on people that he worked for, but he was always, it's like his main job in life was to please Andrew Carnegie. Um, and then really my favorite of all these guys was, uh, was the scientist John Bell Hatcher, who was a young man, also worked for Marsh, uh, finding bones around the West, and later, and, and after spending several years in Patagonia, uh, hunting fossils for Princeton, uh, came to the Carnegie Museum after they kind of budged Reed out of the job. That's a, all kinds of conflicts here. But Hatcher was really the most brilliant scientist of all of them. He had global ideas about the connections of continents that would later become our understanding of, of uh, continental drift. Um, and, and he was just a, a big thinker and a hard worker. And um, yeah, I think maybe you'll like him too when you find out more about him. Um, and then of course, on top of everything is, uh, is Andrew Carnegie himself, the steel tycoon, not an unfamiliar name among Pittsburghers. Um, as you know, he was, uh, he was of all the ro robber barons and the tycoons of the late 19th century, Rockefeller, Morgan, Carnegie and the rest. Carnegie was the only one who was born into genuine poverty, came to uh, Pittsburgh from Scotland with his family when he was 13 years old, rose by the time he was already in his mid twenties to substantial wealth and not going into the steel business until he was in his um, mid thirties. But once he got there, he changed American manufacturing um, by always investing, reinvesting his profits back into the mills, back into the mills, modernizing those mills, even when they weren't worn out and driving the cost of producing a ton of steel down and down and down and down and forcing all his, uh, all his competitors to scramble to keep up. It was an amazing achievement and it was not without a huge human cost. If I had this book to write over again, I would be a little harder on Carnegie, I think. I've since that time read Paul Krauss's wonderful book about the homestead strike. It's called The Battle for Homestead. You might wanna check that out too, another University of Pittsburgh Press book. And it makes you realize the enormous human cost on people and on Pittsburgh of having uh, smashed the unions there in 1892 and driven them out of the steel business for 45 years before they came back. That's a thing that we all need to think about when we think about Andrew Carnegie's wonderful philosophy, sorry, philanthropy. Uh, by 1899, the time of this book, he was in his early 60s. He was looking around, he was tired of doing what he was doing, was looking around for new things to do and um, did feel real responsibility for his wealth. And to his, to his credit, before he died in 1919, he gave away all but 10% of it. Um, and he did say, you know, he's famous for saying, the man who dies rich dies disgraced uh, because he felt it was his job once he'd made all that money to give it away. And he did, but he gave it to charities that had his name on them, which is part of the way the guy was. He was five feet, two inches tall. Um, he cared about his reputation. He was full of a vast um, sort of unreflective self-confidence. And the thing about this dinosaur was, that, um, uh, well, I'll back up a second. Uh, so that I'll, I will, I'll, all, these, all this scrambling in, in the West and in Wyoming finally lands the dinosaur in Pittsburgh in about 1901. And uh, Hatcher, who's the main scientist there at, at the museum by then, um, does the science on it, writes a monograph, and there's a picture in there of the, uh, in the monograph of the dinosaur. <clears throat> long, you know, it was 84 feet long over the, over the curves from tail to, to nose. And that picture um, was hanging over the fireplace uh, of Andrew Carnegie's castle in Scotland when the King of England came for lunch one day. And, uh, and the King says, um, well, Mr. Carnegie, what is, what is this? And Carnegie, five feet two, says, why, that's my namesake, the largest animal that ever walked the earth. And the King's, pretty impressed and he says, can we get one of those for the British Museum? And, and Carnegie says, um, I'll talk to my man Holland about that. And so, uh, so through a whole series of events, more casts get made, you know, Carnegie the manufacturer is the guy who knows how to, um, who, th who understands that when you make more objects than one at a time, you drive down the unit cost and, and eventually Carnegie uh, gives casts of this dinosaur to all the crowned heads of Europe, 
And so even today, you can see casts of this Wyoming dinosaur. In, you can see the real dinosaur in Pittsburgh. You can see the casts in London, Paris, Berlin, Moscow, Vienna, Bologna, Italy, Madrid, Spain, um, uh, La Plata, Argentina, Mexico City, and Vernal, Utah. And all, um, and that's the reason, and this is right at the time when people are starting to build around the, around the Western world, around the West, these large museums, temples to science, people have called them, are starting to be built. The Carnegie Museum was, was built and then expanded substantially right around the turn of the last century, uh, and, and others in all those cities also were being built about the same time. And so people are coming to these museums in large members numbers. They're seeing these dinosaurs. They're thinking about the past in a new and profoundly different way than they ever have before by seeing this animal and imagining from its bones what it must have been like. I also thought, um, and how I came to this topic was kind of in small pieces. It, uh, it's almost like sometimes I think it chose me. That's, I don't know. Um, but I, so I, um, my, I live here in Casper, Wyoming. I grew up in Pittsburgh, PA, looking at those dinosaurs, admiring their enormous height and bulk and thinking what they must have been like. I remember as a kid going to the old dinosaur hall, which many of you may remember. Um, there were five dinosaurs in that hall. There was a Stegosaurus, a Triceratops, a T-Rex, uh, an Apatosaurus, we called them Brontosaurus then, and, um, and this Diplodocus. And on the wall was that great bas-relief mount of the juvenile Camarasaurus. And on the far end was that huge floor-to-ceiling mural, in my mind it's 30 feet high, I don't know, of the T-Rex, and he's green and he's got a red tongue and he's kind of tripoded back on his tail, kind of like Godzilla. And he's really, he's got it. That dinosaur was frowning, at least in my memory. He was pretty scary to look at. And over in the corner was this giant clam. And I just, I just loved going into that room. And I, and every time when I was a kid, I just loved it, never got enough of it. So that was always in the back of my mind. I came to the West in the mid 1970s and, um, as a young man. And I, and I, I won't tell you my whole life story, but by the late 1980s, I was working here in Casper, Wyoming on the daily Casper star Tribune. And, um, it was a great paper, by the way, let me just say it was a great paper then. Wyoming at that time, don't forget, still had fewer than half a million people in it. And this paper with 34,000 subscribers distributed over 100,000 square miles, think about that, uh, uh, was a great, was, had an enormous influence on, on life and politics in the state of Wyoming. And um, so I was happy to work there and I was mostly the education reporter, but in 1990 was the 100th anniversary of the statehood of Wyoming, and we were doing a special edition, sort of a supplement. And my editor, the excellent Dan Whipple, said to me, uh, "So, is there something you like to you're curious about? You'd like to find out more about? We can we can put in this." I said, "Well, you know, I've I've always thought those dinosaurs uh, at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh came from Wyoming. I think they all came from Wyoming." And he's and I think that might make a pretty interesting story. I'd like I've always wanted to know how they got there. And he said, "Well, okay, well." It turns out only one of them came Wyoming, you know, and that one of them came from Wyoming, and that was this, that was this Diplodocus. <laughs> so I got in touch with this guy Brent Breithaupt, who was the, um, who was the director of the uh, geological museum at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, Wyoming, which is um, which is 150 miles south of here, of where I am here in Casper, um, and Brent knew the story pretty much. Uh, of how the Diplodocus was found by uh, people working for the Carnegie Museum. And uh, particularly Brent was a, knew a lot about Bill Reed because Bill Reed later went on to become a longtime employee of the University of Wyoming and sort of Brent, in a way, Brent's predecessor and founder of that geological museum. So Brent cared a lot about Bill and, and he put me onto this story. So I wrote up an early version of that story, of that discovery, which was based on an article stay with me now, written in the early 1950s by a man named Arthur Coggeshall, who'd been there in 1899 at the time when they found, when they found the bones. Coggeshall's memory, I was to learn later, was a little hazy, and he got some things wrong, so I got some things wrong in that article I wrote uh, for the newspaper in 1990. Um, as the, more years went by, 
every now and then another interesting fossil story or event would come along and the paper would assign me to go cover it. So I was gradually learning more about fossils and more about dinosaurs and more about paleontology and how it gets done now and how it got done then. And uh, when I finally came time for me to leave the paper um, in the late 1990s, one big project I had in my mind was to, was to do a book, probably with Brent, we'd talked about doing this together, of a series of different uh, fossil-related contexts, uh, um, conflicts around the West. And then I got back to Pittsburgh one time, where my mom was still living, and I got to do some research uh, in Pittsburgh. What I found were these letters. And um, my first introduction to this correspondence was uh, through Betty Hill, Elizabeth Hill, who ran the big bone room in the basement of the Carnegie Museum at the time. Big bone room means doesn't mean it was a big room. It was a pretty big room. But it's where the big bones stayed when they weren't on display in the museum. Big dinosaur bones. And Betty, a wonderful person, uh, would pick up the phone down there and she'd say, Big bone room! And that was how you knew that uh, Betty was down there answering the phone, you know. And so, um, so, in, uh, so Betty uh, had some correspondence among these different people I've been telling you about um, in loose leaf folders in a cabinet she had in the big bone room. She'd read them all very closely. These people were important to her um, in a good way. And so she put me onto that story. And, and, and then through her, I was able to find uh, that, in fact, there were um, letter books in several different archives. Important men like William Holland and Andrew Carnegie had staff who typed the letters for them as they, when they, they would dictate letters. I'm sure the women would take uh, notes and, and, and then they'd type up the letters. And then they would save carbon copies of those letters, both outgoing letters, and they'd save the incoming letters. And they'd put it all together in these correspondence books, these letter books they're called, for each six months for Holland's correspondence was a letter book about this thick. So he was probably writing, you know, two, three letters a day, five letters a day sometimes. And the mail was really good. You could, you could post a letter, you could put a letter in the mail in Laramie, Wyoming, early on a Monday morning. It would reach Pittsburgh on a Wednesday. Holland could answer it that day, get, get it back in the mail that day, and that person would have an answer in Laramie, Wyoming by Friday. Pretty remarkable when you think about it. Of course, if they were out in the field, it would take months and months for those for that course for that round trip to happen. So there's all these letters. There's letters. There's letters in the Carnegie Museum library. There's letters. There were letters in the Carnegie Museum annex, which was in East Liberty at the time. There were letters in the Carnegie Library. That's where Andrew Carnegie's correspondence was, not the museum library, the actual library, all part of the same building, as you know. And there were letters uh, in the Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania downtown, where they had the correspondence from, from uh, Holland's position as chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so I, all these different places I worked in over several different visits to Pittsburgh, staying with my mom. Uh, I, we grew up in Squirrel Hill, I grew up in Squirrel Hill, and uh, so it was a very short trip to the museum and to Oakland, and not far to downtown. And um, <clears throat> and finally, I can still remember the day back here in Pittsburgh, having made Xeroxes of all the letters that I wanted to keep, getting them all stacked up in chronological order. I had a pile, <clears throat> a stack of letters about this high. And it was just a, I thought, okay, now I can do this book. It was just like reading geological <clears throat> strata, you know what I mean? So then I wrote the book. The book was published in uh, 2001. Got some nice reviews, got a very nice review with the Times Literary Supplement in London and other nice places. And, um, and I kept being interested in, in paleontology and other topics, but I went on and wrote another book or two and, and was thinking about other projects. And then in, uh, in 2005, I think it was, 2004 or five, uh, the press brought out a, a paperback of the book, and I went back to Pittsburgh for that, and they, they arranged for a wonderful chance for me to give a slide talk uh, on the stage at the, in the music hall in the Carnegie Museum. And, um, and that, right at that time, the, <clears throat> the new dinosaur exhibit in Pittsburgh was just about finished, not quite finished. 
uh, with those wonderful new mounts, you know, they remounted all those old mounts, which were sort of stiff and straight, uh, into those wonderful, much more active, um, you know, with the, with the long necks and the long tails of the, of the sauropod dinosaurs swirling around the room and the plants at their feet, you know, it's, and all that daylight coming down from the top of the building. That's just, that's such a splendid, uh, such a splendid exhibit there. And right at that time, as that exhibit was, was, uh, was being made was when Matt Lamana came onto the Carnegie Museum staff, and he's now um, he's now the curator of paleontology at the Carnegie Museum, and and uh, I should say he's he's written. Um, we'll hear more from Matt and me in a minute, but he's uh, Matt has written a foreword to this book, which is really really generous and great of him to do. Thank you, Matt. Um, so. Back here in 2005, and then another thing that happened was in 2010 or 11, around in there, out of the blue one day, I got an email from from a Dutch, a young Dutch scholar, uh, and he was deeply interested in Car- Diplodocus carnegii, the Carnegie Diplodocus, um, because he was doing a book really on, he was doing his, his PhD thesis on... Um, on the rest of the story, the European end of the story, which was only one chapter in my book, and which was which had, there was a lot more to tell, but you had to be this guy to tell it. His name is Ilya Neuland, and he, uh, you know, he can read and speak. He's lots of European languages: Dutch, of course, English, German, French, Spanish, and Italian. All those things which were useful in reading these correspondences. And he's a really highly trained. Um, historian of science, and he's great at understanding culture, and he's great at understanding, um, I guess you'd call it celebrity at the time, and how it worked, and how that worked in with science. And so his book, uh, American Dinosaur Abroad, was published by the University of Pittsburgh Press two years ago, 2019. And uh, maybe it was because uh, the press was realizing, you know, we've got a good story here, this (laughs) dinosaur, so maybe we could uh, do a 20th anniversary uh, um, edition of Bone Wars, too. So, it's certainly nice for me. They contacted me last year, <clears throat> and I said, yeah, that'd be great. So I agreed to write a new last chapter for the book, and afterward, and that chapter, um, kind of what I decided to do was to kind of bring the story up to now, uh, by, mostly by telling the story, by concentrating on three museums, uh, since the 1930s, at least for the for the Carnegie Museum, and then the more recent um, Tate Museum at Casper College, a community college here in Casper, Wyoming, where I live, which has an active uh, paleontology program, and the Geological Museum at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, where, as I told you, Brent was the director, was the curator, I guess, um, until he left. So all these stories are full of new conflicts, new strong personalities. And, uh, and finally we get some women in the story because the whole first part of the story has pretty much no women in it. And thank goodness for the fate of paleontology and science in general. There are a whole lot more women doing science now, and it's really good for the, for the science. Um, that's, um, that's pretty much it, I guess. Uh, I hope I've been talking, I hope you've enjoyed this. And again, thanks to Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures and to the University of Pittsburgh Press. My name's Tom Ray. The name of the book is Bone Wars. Tom, thank you so much for that very interesting talk. Um, And we'll just get right into the questions. As you stated a couple of times, this one is is kind of has a little bit of a long preamble. um, So I'm I'm gonna tee it up and hopefully you can knock it out of the park. Um, But uh, as you stated a couple of times in your lecture, uh, Bone Wars is perhaps first and foremost a tale about the fascinating interactions of people with big personalities. And uh, many of your insights into those people's mindsets were drawn from their personal correspondence. But as you noted, modern scientists, museum administrators, and other professionals rarely send snail mail or archive their conversations, at least in any physical form. So how will future science historians dig into events that are going on right now, discoveries that are being made at this very moment? Boy, I don't know. Um, (laughs) I I really don't know. I wonder about that a lot. I, I have some, you know, some people I know that work in archives and that 
that profession is constantly changing as they have to keep up with thinking about ways to keep electronic communication available to the future. I, when I was working on that book, I didn't realize really what a huge lecture of uh, luxury it is to, to be able to go back and find those, find those letters. And, you know, sometimes you have to learn to read people's hands writings, but that's, that's an adventure. Um, and it's such a, it's such a permanent, uh, uh, you know, it's been such a permanent way of communicating for so many hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years. It's hard to imagine it going away, but I think it's going away. Yeah. I mean, what we're doing here is the new kind of storytelling video. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an expert on that stuff, and I do worry about that stuff. I so are, it, more if I was it, an artist. Can you think of things that... Um, you know, I, I don't know if there is an answer to this question, but can you think of things that that modern scientists and museum administrators could do to like help preserve these stories, like help preserve these legacies? I mean, you know, as you probably know, a lot of them are like, you know, <laughs> you know, hundred chain, you know, hundred message email chains or something like that. And yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> well, when you have a group of colleagues working on a single paper, um, is there any other document besides the final draft of the paper that that you keep as a kind of a way to remind yourselves how you got there? It, you know, it, it, it depends, um, but I am definitely one, I'm a total pack rat, digitally speaking. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, certainly, like, I, I think maybe it comes from working in a museum, like you do, you never know what stories are gonna be important to people in the future. And so like, in my own digital files, like I, I name everything like pretty clearly. Like I do think that, you know, if, <laughs> if somebody ever <laughs> is masochistic enough to go through my files, to try to tell the story of, you know, 21st century, um, you know, paleontology at the Carnegie museum. Um, I do think they'll be able to find some stuff just because like, I'm pretty conscious. I think because of things like your book, I'm very conscious of like the fact that we don't know what stories are going to be important in the future, you know? Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. When I was, um, when I was just last week or the week before when I was getting ready to talk with you guys, I thought, no, I had a, I had a PowerPoint for Bone Wars some years ago, but that was on a previous laptop and it doesn't seem to have made it over to this one. And fortunately I still had it <laughs> in the cupboard and it still worked. And there it was, I found it, you know, but, um, that just was just good luck. So, I mean, I think of myself as systematic about this kind of thing and there it was, I couldn't find it. So. Yeah, yeah, one thing we talk about a lot at the museum is like, you know, are the file formats even, even if we are meticulous about saving things digitally, are the file formats that we're using today going to be readable, uh, you know, to future generations? And, you know, obviously not being a technology person, uh, I don't have an answer for that either. I guess cross our fingers and hope, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But um but um, okay, so <laughs> next question is is totally switching gears and um, and is is uh, maybe a little bit more directly related to uh, the book and your uh, comments on it that you that you uh, presented earlier. And so um, and <laughs> this was just prompted by my my uh, my hearing your talk. You describe uh, the Carnegie Museum's second director, William Jacob Jacob Holland, as a, uh, a colorful person, not a potentially not a very likable person. Uh, and I was just curious to know, um, you know, of course, with the the kind of retrospective history, you know, a lot of Holland's, you know, sort of misdeeds and maybe not so great personality traits have been, you know, sort of uh, you know obliterated by history because you know he's. He was very important for our museum in early in its 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 uh, in its early days. Um, but do you remember any like specific letters or statements or documents of Holland that were Holland's that were particularly colorful or that had like an exceptionally strong influence on how you came to regard him? Um, I think our viewers might be entertained by um, you know this little glimpse into the personality of, of this uh, this uh, former director of our museum. Yeah, I can, I know I I can tell you one thing. Um, so Holland, besides, before he was a paleontologist, he was a, he was a lepidopterist and he did two books, huge books, this, this thick, uh, the one was the moth book and one was the butterfly book, uh, illustrating thousands of species of each of those. And every one of those little tiny pictures, little miniature pictures, he painted himself in oil. So he was, a, he was sort of a miniaturist painter as well. Mm. Um, when he went to, um, when he went to Argentina, he and uh, his 
bone guy, Arthur Cogashaw, went to Argentina to to do the to put up the Diplodocus there. Uh, he painted sort of landscapes and seascapes. They went there by ship, and he wrote a book about it. And uh, but he, and each time he would go to all these places, and he he'd dine with the kings and queens and the presidents and stuff, and and his bone guy be in the museum doing doing all the work, and and uh, and <laughs> and so. But they would always give him. Um, some kind of metal, often in, in all these different European capitals, and um, and he would come back to Pittsburgh, and there's a portrait of him that was hanging somewhere, I guess, in one of his offices, and um, he would carefully paint the new metal on the robe that he's wearing in the picture. So it looks like he's wearing <laughs> sport, of it, but it looks kind of it looks a little bit like attached later. Last time I was there, that that portrait is hanging. Uh, in the museum, in the uh, in the music hall, around that that space around the back of the theater where the people sit, so you can go check. I think it's there. So and you can see that, uh, yeah. So that was important to him to make sure that he was paid <laughs> on on all the medals that he was receiving while the other guys were doing the work. So yeah. Wow, uh, I can see why that story <laughs> would lead to a negative opinion of him. That's that sounds like a fairly uh, fairly pompous thing to do. Um, hopefully, he won't haunt my office for saying that because um, we have we have a, a, a joke around the museum that the ghost of, of William Holland uh, haunts the butterfly collection. So hopefully, he won't pay a visit to my office. If that's not, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Um, but he was, you know, a, a, you know, a very important person for us early in our history. But um, yeah, that's a pretty, uh, pretty uh, <laughs> self-righteous thing to do, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, this is a kind of a, a detail question, but it's another one that I, I just was jotting notes down furiously as you were talking in your the previous presentation. And um, I love the response you quoted from Andrew Carnegie to King Edward VII um, when, when King Edward saw the, you know, the picture of Diplodocus Carnegii on Andrew Carnegie's wall and said something like, you know, what is this or what is that? Uh, you said something to the effect of, you know, why King? That's my namesake, the biggest animal that ever walked the earth. Um, right. I'd never heard that story before, and I love it. Um, it's probably in in the the original Bone War somewhere, but it's you know it's been a couple of years since I read it last. What's the source of that account? Um, and I ask only because I'm planning to steal it for my own tours mm -hmm. of the the big Bone Room in the future. <laughs> the source of that is uh, Arthur Coggeshall's article um, in the Carnegie Magazine in the early 1950s. So that's that's the way the story was being told by then, and. Uh, and Cogsell put that in, in in that article. That's the article that had a lot of sort of misrememberings of how things had come about uh, that I used for the first article I wrote and then got back into the letters and found things were more complicated and much more interesting. But yes, he uses that wonderful anecdote of, yes, why that's my namesake, the largest animal that ever walked the earth, <laughs> yeah. Right, and this is especially, um, uh, I guess, uh, illustrative, given that Carnegie himself was what five foot two. You said something like that. Five yeah. foot two. And and yeah. by giving those gifts to those kings and emperors, he was putting himself on the kind of a you know same level with them in his mind, and and maybe in fact, and and also he was a guy who believed very much in um, personal one on one contacts as a way to solve the problems of the world, and so. That's why, I mean, he, you know, he paid the money to build the Peace Palace in The Hague in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the Netherlands. And he had a great belief that if he, that if the kings and the kaisers and the presidents, this is in the decade before World War I, uh, could just sit down and talk to each other and get to know with each other, the world would have peace. And um, he turned out to be wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, tragically wrong. It's some. Um, it, I sometimes think about you know Carnegie died in 1919. I think yeah. um, right. you know one year after what had been to that point the the most devastating war in the history of the planet. It must have been a a, a very um, he must have in in that sense at least died a, a pretty unhappy you know un, unsatisfied person. Um, you know if if your you know goal is world peace and World War One just happens. I mean you know it's got to be devastating, but. Um, 
but yeah, that's, <laughs> I'll uh, turn it back to a little bit of a, a happier note. <laughs> I got a little dark there for a second. Um, I loved how uh, this is, it's just, it's so interesting to me to, to hear like you talk about your experiences with, with some of my colleagues or predecessors at the Carnegie Museum. And I loved, I had forgotten this, but I loved how you described how our former collection manager, Betty Hill, who, you know, to me uh, was, you know, uh, when, while she was alive, um, was, you know, probably the greatest guru of of paleontology at the Carnegie Museum but I loved how you how you talked about how she would answer the phone like you know like like in in uh forgive me but sort of a yinzer accent um and saying something like you know big bone room or whatever um so that's just a like a segue into a question that I I may have asked you before but if I haven't I've always wanted to ask you and I remember distinctly uh, in the previous edition of Bone Wars, there's a there's sort of a line almost in passing where you say, you know, there's only one detail that Betty and I didn't agree on. Um, uh, and uh, I've always been <laughs> what I've always wondered what that was. Um, I and, and I was wondering if you could share. I don't remember. OK. Oh, well, now I'm going to go find that out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't remember what that was. It was something about Hatcher, I think. Uh, okay. Uh, but I don't, I don't remember what it was. I was always wondering if it was the, um, the sort of, I think that in Bone Wars, you, and I, forgive me if I'm misremembering this, but I think that in Bone Wars, you sort of dispel this kind of um, longstanding tradition that the article that Carnegie saw was that New York Journal and Advertiser big splash you know, with, um, you know, so the, so for those that won't be familiar with the story, Andrew Carnegie sees an article in a newspaper and that inspires him to finance the hunt that ultimately leads to the discovery of Diplodocus Carnegii. And I think traditionally in the museum, we had thought that that article was this big, like, you know, sort of full page spread, most colossal animal ever on earth just discovered out West. And I think in Bone Wars, you actually argue that it's a, a smaller, less, maybe a little bit less ostentatious article. Could you go yeah, into something that a about bit? the timing of the publication of the articles and the timing of the letters about it made it clear that it couldn't have been that one. Although that one is so fun. I mean, it's, you know, it's that, it's that, uh, well, they called it Brontosaurus giganteus there in the paper, and it's tipped back on its tail, and it's looking into the 11th floor of the New York Life Building with a little trolley car going under its tail. It's a great picture. And yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was, yeah, it was something about the timing of the, of, the news, of the dates on the news articles and the dates on the letters. It couldn't quite have been that one, but it was another one. He wrote a note on it, sent it to Holland, and said. Yeah, and that's just, that's just such an awesome example of how you know, this detective work in archives can, you know, can get to the bottom of things or can dispel myths that have become sort of entrenched even within an institution, you know, and, right. and that I think is, that's what I, I also fear we, you know, we lose with the, you know, sort of the, the not as rigorous archiving, I think that that happens these days. Um, I'll just also add that my two favorite things about that that New York Journal article yeah. are the subtitles underneath most colossal right. animal. Right. It's um my two favorites are when it was when it was hungry it ate a stomach big enough to hold three elephants yeah, right. and <laughs> and when it was angry its terrible roar could be heard for 10 miles. Right, um, right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for viewers out there, then and now, we don't know the answer. <laughs> like, there's, uh, we don't know how far the dinosaurs roar would be would be heard from. Um, but uh, also, uh, this this is, I guess, a little bit related in the sense that it's it's kind of a uh, sort of historical accuracy accuracy versus traditional account. Um, you know, the traditional account at the Carnegie Museum, um, you know, even according to pretty reliable sources like Jack McIntosh, who was the, you know, sort of the, uh, the, 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 you know, um, most knowledgeable person about our sauropod collection until his passing, um, you know, many people quote that Diplodocus Carnegie I was discovered on July 4th, 1899, and therefore refer to it as the star spangled dinosaur. And um, following from uh, your account, I often will say July 2 or July 3. Um, and uh, 
do, what what was the um, what was the evidence that suggests that that star spangled dinosaur story that the you know that Diplodocus was discovered on July fourth? What's the evidence uh, that 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 was just you know sort of revisionist history or faulty memories or or even clever marketing potentially? Again, that July fourth date came from that same Cogsall article and uh, Workman's letter to back to Holland was made it clear it was the second or the third. Yeah. Yeah. So again, um, uh, Coggeshell was writing in 1952 or 54, something like that, about something that happened more than 50 years earlier. And so that's probably the way the story got told around the museum was that it was on the 4th of July. And yeah, we like that. So, yeah. But yeah. That, again, just such a great example of how, you know, right. how uh, our memories are faulty and that's why it's super important to document this yeah. type of stuff. And, you know, obviously Cogshaw wasn't making stuff up. It's just how he, you know, how he remembered it when he was asked to tell the tale, you know, what, 50 something years later. Um, you know, if you, if, if I'm fortunate enough to live to be, <laughs> live for another 50 years, uh, if you ask me to recount this conversation, it's probably going to be totally different from what we, what, what we actually said. So, um, uh, so just as a, on a kind of a similar, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, Matt digs into minor details that he's not clear on note. Um, but it, another thing that's never been totally clear to me. And again, I need to go back and read bone wars again. I've read it at least twice so far, cover to cover. Um, uh, but what I've always wanted to know is what was, and, and when I go to tell this story in tours of the Bing Bone Room, of tours of the Carnegie Museum Vertebrate Paleontology Collection, I often kind of gloss over this part because to be totally honest, I don't really know what happened. But um, so what was the deal with the supposed most colossal animal found by Bill Reed? You know, in other words, the, the fossil that inspired the newspaper story uh, that led Andrew Carnegie to, um, you know, to, to uh, you know, mandate the expedition that would just lead to the discovery of Diplodocus carnegii. Um, so Holland ends up bringing back a chunk of thigh bone, roughly the size of a beer keg, and we've actually got it on display in the Carnegie Museum. Um, was that all there ever was of this animal, or were, was there more in the ground that didn't get collected for some reason? Was it um, was it entirely, you know, the newspaper article just based on this chunk of thigh bone and Bill Reed saying I'd found this giant dinosaur? I mean, what, what was the deal with that? Uh, a lot of between the lines there, and it's very hard to know exactly. But uh, I mean, I don't I don't know how Reed ever got in touch with how the initial news stories got into the paper. I just don't, I just don't know that. Um, it is pretty clear that he saw it in his interest to um, enlarge the size of the underground dinosaur that hadn't been dug out yet. Uh, uh, and that he needed both to impress his employers at the University of Wyoming and maybe anybody else who might be interested because maybe he was already looking around hoping for other employment. <clears throat> and that kind of um, writing in newspapers was happening more and more. And so he was probably aware of that too. Um, also though, where he found the dinosaur sometime that spring after he had agreed to go to Pittsburgh, the sequence of events there is very convoluted. I'm trying to remember, um, but maybe before he had told his employers he was really leaving, somewhere around in there, uh, someone went out to the bone quarry and smash some bones. And that might have been uh, uh, his UW University of Wyoming supervisor, Wilbur Knight, or students of Wilbur Knight, but some bones were definitely um, <clears throat> wrecked. And there's a letter, there's a missing letter back to Holland describing what happened. And, and all we have is a letter from Holland back to Workman saying, um, full of Holland-esque ire and anger. Holland's writing gets really clear and sort of loud and when he's really, really angry. And that, that's the part where he says something about, well, if those men at the University of Wyoming can't treat manly men in a manly way, then something about as full of something as an egg is of meat. It's a great sentence, I wish I could quote it directly. But, but that angry, angry letter is in response to a description that Workman wrote him about um, the bones being smashed at the previous quarry. But by then they'd already left that quarry 
because it hadn't turned out as good as they thought. And they were prospecting uh, 30 or 40 miles away on where they eventually found the, found the Diplodocus. So it may not have been that much of a loss. It's hard to know what was there. I've been back out years when I was working on the book with some friends. We went back out to some Morrison formation on a hillside that might have been about where that was. And we found some little scraps of dinosaur bone, but. Um, oh, nice. I, Maybe I pieces. Where it was. Yeah. Pieces of the animal whose stomach could hold three elephants. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, obviously, you know, all's well that ends well, right? I mean, you know, right. that dinosaur or whatever, however much there was or, or, right. or wasn't at the beginning, you know, is what got the Carnegie paleontologists out to Wyoming and led to the discovery of Diplodocus Carnegie. Right. So, um, you know, so, um, but I, I just have always been, been curious about that. Um, uh, Again, a little bit of a, a gear switch here, but I was I was very happy to hear you mention another mutual friend and colleague of ours, and that's Ilya Neuland. Um, as you stated, he um, he recently published American Dinosaur Abroad: A Cultural History of Andrew Carnegie's Plaster Diplodocus with University of Pittsburgh Press. Um, <laughs> I, I, you may have heard me make this analogy before, but you know, to me, Bone Wars is the original 1977 Star Wars. American American Dinosaur Abroad is the is Diplodocus Strikes Back. Um, <laughs> what's next in the trilogy of Carnegie Museum paleontological history? In oh short, um, what other exciting stories in our history have yet to be told? I don't know. What do you think? You spend a lot more time there than I do. Well, I, I think of like I think of things like. Um, uh, this probably isn't a book length saga, but like our acquisition of the holotype of Tyrannosaurus rex, I think is a very interesting story that has, yeah. um, there's some, what I would call misconceptions about um, that could be could be dispelled. Um, I also think there's probably fertile ground in our fossil mammal collection. Um, you know, for instance, the um, the Carnegie Museum work in the early earliest 20th century at what would become um, uh, Agate Springs or uh, Agate Fossil Beds National Monument. Um, same goes for Dinosaur National Monument, the discovery of, of um, uh, in 1909, Earl Douglas's discovery of, of dinosaur bones there. Uh, that might be the, the return of the Jedi <laughs> of, um, of, of, the, of di the history of dinosaurs at the Carnegie Museum. Um, yeah, I did and, go um, a long way toward writing, actually writing, putting together a book proposal for a, a biography of Earl Douglas. Um, oh, fantastic. So, but I never finished that project. But yeah, it's back there. I suppose someone could, I could dig that. Out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of I think a lot of these kinds of really interesting, you know, sort of truth versus traditional accounts. Uh, not only in our collection, but probably in in many other um, the histories of many other paleontological collections as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess I think we're probably getting close to time. Uh, and, and so if I have time for one more question, I will ask this. And I think it's a good way to, to close because we've been talking about the past and, and you know, I want to talk a little bit about the future now. Uh, I was super excited when I got uh, an advanced copy of the, the new you know, final chapter or epilogue, or I can't remember precisely what, what we ended up calling it, but you know, the new final chapter of, of Bone Wars, um, when I, I got that to use to help me prepare the, the foreword, um, that by the way, I'm super honored that, that you and Pitt Press uh, asked me to write. Thank you so much for that. Um, as you know, the book means a great deal to me. And uh, it was just, a, yeah, I was, uh, I was really, really honored um, and also a little bit intimidated when, um, when I got asked to write that. But um, I was really excited to see that you chose to highlight um, modern paleontological activities in Wyoming, and especially those that are being led by female scientists, um, several of whom are really, really good friends of mine, especially Kelly Trujillo and Ellen Carano. Um, what developments are we likely to see in Wyoming paleontology in the near future? Or, you know, what would you like to see? What stories will future historians of science tell about Wyoming paleontology? Like what's happening now that you think will make, uh, you know, the next great saga in Wyoming paleontology? I hope they're good stories. I hope they're positive stories. Um, all three of those institutions, well, no, not you guys. I don't know about you, but uh, both the UW Geological Museum and the Tate Museum have been through the difficulties of institutional support. And, uh, and Wyoming higher education in general and humanities especially uh, are having a hard time right now just because our public coffers are are being so devastated by the change in our 
fossil fuel economy. And so that's, uh, that's one thing that I'm just sort of worried about. So I hope the science can keep getting done. There was a, there was a great uh, recent series of films of paleontology road trips around the Northern Plains in Wyoming, Montana, and the Dakotas. Have you seen that show? And uh, she's, she's a, with a great female host and, and she stops and talks to people you and I know uh, uh, in, in digging bones in all four of those states. And that's great. So that seems to be extremely positive and, um, and outward looking. I also think Ellen's um, Bearded Lady Project is just fantastic. I mean, I, I think uh, um, for, I don't think I mentioned this yesterday in the talk, but uh, she's a paleobotanist at the University of Wyoming and she and a, and a filmmaker friend from the East uh, in their frustration at, at women's ability to advance in vertebrate paleontology uh, started putting on false beards and made a great uh, book of portraits, beautiful black and white portraits of, of women wearing false beards. And, and they're making a film about it too. It's called The Bearded Lady Project. You can look it up. And I, I think that's just such a, it's a real feather in the cap, I guess you'd call it for the University of Wyoming to have this creative scientist on their, on their faculty who's, uh, who's not only doing good science, but trying to change how the science gets done in a really positive way. So I see that as great. Yeah. Yeah. Ellen, that project is, is really remarkable. And, and as you said, she's, you know, she's just as, as fantastic as, as a, uh, as a, a paleontologist as well. Um, well, I think that that's probably all I've got. Um, uh, thank you so much, Tom Ray, for, uh, for being with us today. And uh, for, um, again, thank you for uh, allowing me to write the forward to, to your book. I was very honored and humbled to be able to do that. Um, uh, the book is the 20th anniversary edition of Bone Wars, the excavation and celebrity of Andrew Carnegie's dinosaurs. Uh, thank you, Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures and University of Pittsburgh Press for inviting us to do this presentation. And thank you all for viewing. Mm -hmm.